And those animals rushed into the cities. Is that a miraculous reality or is that a manipulation again of nature? There's no defying the laws of physics there. Therefore, once again, it's a pellet. All right, Dever, for goodness sakes, pestilence. For, it was, was Corona, was COVID, and Nessa a pellet. Uh, it was a bell. All of a sudden, some crazy lab uh, leaked out something in China, and we're all closed down in, in, in our houses. Okay, so that's never. It was pestilence. That's not a nace. That's a bell. So supper. We're just and then. That's when the shin. It's a hadash shin. The fact that people have skin lesions, boils, is that miraculous? Or once again, the fact that God chose to create a certain skin virus, which thus would create a reality that people would break out in boils, it's just like COVID. That would be a pella. So so far, we're looking at reality that we're more so celebrating more the fact that God that controls and manipulates nature than defies the laws of nature. So far, that's a, the most important part of this deal. That's the Pella, the Tzach Adash, Be'achab, Borod. Okay, so Borod, as we know in the Chumash, was a mixture of ice with fire in it. That is impossible. That defies the laws of nature. That we have to melt the ice. There's no such thing as fire existing in, encapsulated with ice. That would be a nest. So far, for thank God, I have miracle number two out of all the us, a bunch of play. Okay, Borod. Uh, Arba, Arba, hey, anybody living in Baltimore has that every 16 years, you know what I mean? Well, a big deal. That is far from being a net, a, 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 a net. That is a pella. Okay, all of a sudden it happened for one week at this period of time specifically, that's a pella. Once again, God played with nature, manipulated nature. Uh, now, what is choshech? Let's be honest of what it is, okay? I'll, I'll deal with the Rambam specifically in his Maria, how he explains Choshech, also Ibn Ezra. We're talking about a deep setted fog, which basically, that's why by Yomesh Choshech, you could feel it, okay? When it said that they didn't move, you don't really think that they couldn't move. If they couldn't move, what happens if a guy had his mouth closed, he couldn't open it? They didn't eat for seven days or drink for seven days, so they should have all died of, of, of hunger. Why does anybody say, how does anybody live without eating or drinking for seven days? Couldn't say, this a nace, but they nace. Never heard that before. So why not to take away these weird stories that we picked up in kindergarten that somehow if you were walking like this, you stayed in that position. That's a, this is a chanarishka. What does it mean? It means to say it was so dark that people were afraid to move because you remember with people in those days, if you broke a limb, you'd have sense of survival. So people did not freely go anywhere. That's what this is about. People simply did not move. They stayed put. They crawled. They were afraid to move because they would fall and stumble and break. That's what my mind, he says, that the shot that no one would move me would come out. I mean, say they were simply afraid of moving. So what is this? It's a deep set fog, which created a reality that people were so scared to move. They stayed in the space. They ate. They crawled to food. There's no question about it. We have no indication of people dying of hunger at that point in time. Ultimately, therefore, once again, it's a good old tell. Uh, that's all it is. If an Ezra mentions that having said the sailors told them that they have these big, heavy fogs in the ocean, just maybe that's what it was. Uh, you know what I mean? Okay, it makes sense. And this is what basically what Robin takes for granted. So this is a chayshik once again. Pellet. So far, I only have two nisim. I have Dam and I have Bara. Okay, the last one is Bechai Reis. Now, how did they die in the Bechai Reis? Well, you obviously know it says they died because of Gilei Shechina. Okay, that's what the Pasik says. What is, how do you die from Gilei Shechina? It's very simple. You have a heart attack. What happens is you have an enormous, immense, uh, an enormous, intense infusion of information that you can't handle and you're, you're fused by that's what happens. The Arachayim actually describes it that way, but he does it in his poetic way. When you can look up the Arachayim, you'll find it there. They died of heart attacks. Is this a nest to die of a heart attack? I hate to say no. Uh, is it a Pella that there was all of a sudden a uniform Gilish Hina and therefore these people died? Yes, definitely a Pella. What I'm trying to say of the 10 plagues that you would say, I would say two of them were miracles and eight of them were plagues. This comes to teach us the most important thing possible, because when we're looking at the, the plates, 
we realize that they're there to teach us God's presence in, in the world. And here I'm going to flip the page for a moment and go literally to the last page. You have source Yud Zion. Source Yud Zion is a quotation of the Ramban in Shmais Perik Yud Gibel Pasik Tez Zion. And there the Ramban says, um, he quotes, I'm going to read five lines and explain them. He explained the major heresies which were rampant in Egypt at the time. Now, one has to understand that the Jews were totally assimilated in Egypt. They did not believe in one God. They did not believe in monotheism. They even refused to accept it. This is actually a Pusik in Yechesko. If you read Source Yud Bet, chapter 20, where the Pusik there says, I'm going to read a few lines of the Nebuah of Yechesko, where the Pusik says, um, but Marta Lehem, you will tell to them, he's talking about, Yechezka will be talking to the Ziknei er Yisrael that complained that God threw, they don't want to keep, have a relationship with God anymore because he sent them in exile. So he says, Biyom b'chari b'Yisrael, when I chose Israel, yadi, when I raised my arm, Lezer bet Yaakov, stretched out my arm forward to the seat of the house of Jacob, and I let myself known to them in the land of Egypt. I stretched out my hand to them. I introduced them. When did this happen? Well, look at this carefully. This happened way before Moshe Rabbeinu showed up. This is a Pasik in Chomesh where the Chomesh Pasik says over there that Moshe by the snack. When it says, Shlach Nabi Atishlach, that Moshe Rabbeinu says, Why are you sending me? You already have somebody prophesizing this exodus already long before me. Who is this? This is his brother. You open up a Tanchuma and a few other places. Basically, we all know that Aaron was three years older than Moshe. From the age of three, Aaron was already prophesizing this, the, uh, uh, that there's one God and it's going to be a Geula. He prophesied literally for 80 years. This idea. This is in the voice of Aaron. It's only afterwards that Moshe came when Moshe was 80 and Aaron was 83 that Aaron stopped leading the flock. And then Moshe was the prophet, which now continued uh, teaching monotheism and the idea of leaving the pagan world and entering into the monotheistic world of Judaism and the Exodus. So let's read the Pasik. I, I, by Yomahu, Pasik Vav, at that day, Nasati Adi Lahem, I raised my arm to them, Lo Tsiyam, Yes, Mitzrayim. I already offered them to take them out of Egypt, El Aretz Asher Tati Lahem, to the land which I had seen forth for them, the Batchala Budvash, basically, which is very affluent, has a lot of produce. Tzvihi Lecha Aretzot is the most beautiful and has the most stature of all the countries. Lo Lahem, and I told the Jews, in, in Egypt, each she could say enough tashdichu. Throw away the abominations that you have in your eyes. Equals the avodah zara. Uvgilulei mitzrayim alta tamu. Stop polluting yourselves with the avodah zaras of Egypt. Ani, it is I. You can okay, the omnipotent God Elohim, which is your Lord. He says, stop doing avodah zara and come back to my my Rupi, and they. Rebelled in me. Below Avuli Shmoyelai, they did not want to hear me. Ish, as you could say, a name Lo Yishlichu. None of them wanted to walk away from their from the abominations of their eyes. But you lay Mitzrayim Lo Azavu. They did not want to leave the pagan deities of Egypt. But Omar Lishpocha Matialehem, and I said to pour my wrath upon them, Lechalot Apibam, to destroy them. Where? Even while in Egypt, this is a story which is not written in our Chumash, but God tells us the story through Yechezkel. And it was long before Moshe Rabbeinu came, during those 80 years of prophecy, there was a period God said, I will take you out of Egypt, but this one you must walk away from your paganism and join me in monotheistic belief, and I am the Yudke Vavka, the Lord. We said, no, we're not interested. And God was destroy us. Because of that, he felt, well, if that's the case, there's no one to talk about. And what does the Pasuk say? But ask the man Shmi, but I did for my own name, for not for the for the honor of my name. Not 
desecrated in the eyes of the nations, which they are in them, equal to the Egyptians. I should not tell him, could I let myself know publicly and all the guy knew about it? Uh, knew about Lotia Mets, and I will take them out of Egypt, and therefore I did not destroy them. And later it says, Then I did take them out later, the later was with motion. So here we have the story the Pusik is describing how the Jews in Egypt were totally assimilated. Jews were totally assimilated. They were literally, as the Chazal say, Uber be made behema. They were like a fetus in the womb of a cow. God had to literally extract them from, uh, uh, almost impossible to understand how he did it, take them away from deeply entrenched paganism. The language of my mind, if you flip the page and look at source Yud, towards the end of source Yud, it's Rabbi. <laughs> There the Ramam says as follows. I'm going to read the last like 10 lines of how the Ram describes what happened in Egypt. Till the days went well, for a while, Yeshua and Mitzrayim, the Jews were in Egypt for multitudes of days. They actually reverted and came back to learning the actions of the Egyptians. And they were equally worshipping Kochavim uh, stars. Chutz Mishevet Levi, whoever is a lady should pay proud of himself. Shamad Mitzvah Tavot, they continued the commandments of our forefathers. Now there's a very dramatic line which I always quote during the Seder. Literally, there was like a second before. Kemat Kat, there was almost like a barely a second. One would say, if you take the metaphor for Cinderella, there was two seconds before midnight, before you turned into a pumpkin. Kemat Kat, there was like a, my iota of time. Hayah that principle, Sheshatal Avram, that Abraham had planted, the principle of man monotheism, it would be totally uprooted. That was the situation. Monotheism was on the way out totally. The Lush of the Ram is very dramatic. Kemat Kat. Hayad the Tarshi Shatel Avram Ne Ekar. Bechosrim Bnei Yaakov the Ta'uta Olam Vitao Yutam. And then all the children of Yeh Jacob would have come, reverted back to the mistakes of the world and the way of their misled ways. And then whatever happened, because God loved us, Me'avat Hashem Otanu, Mishamrot Ashua, because he kept his oath. To Avram Avinu, Asa Moshe Rabbeinu Rabban Shanavi, he made a Moshe, which would be the the the, the teacher of all prophets, Vishal Cho, and he sent them to reintroduce us to monotheism and to extricate us from this culture of Egypt. This is the story. So we look at Yitzhak Mitzrayim. I know that in the pictures my grandchildren bring back from kindergarten, they have the Jews of Egypt wearing tzitzis and their beards. And they looked like they're from goodness sakes. They were totally culturally uh, integrated. There's one medrash which says that says he thinks they did not intermarry, but I don't know that that is the view of the mainstream view of Chazal. We don't because one medrash we don't know if that's mainstream of Chazal. Just like you have different medrashim, what's they, uh, they they were redeemed. Now, if you look basically across the board. We know three things, but actually there's like eight things happening, different midrashim. It boils down that they kept an ethnic identity. You know, there was no religious identity at all. They were pagans. They did not want to leave Egypt. They had no reason to leave Egypt. They were totally integrated. They may have been at the bottom of the social ladder. They were slaves, uh, menial laborers and slaves. But at the end of the day, they were culturally Egyptians. I would dare say they were intermarried. They went to the same church. They went to the same school. They did the, the typical Egyptian wasn't really much better than them. If you recall your Chumash, Joseph, our great, our great, great, great grand uncle, or whatever the shape you are, um, he's the one that created the feudal system. At the end of Parshas uh, Vayigash, uh, excuse me, Parshas, yeah, Parshas Vayigash, 
no, Vayichi, excuse me, we have the story of, uh, of Joseph acquiring all the lands of all the people and making them nothing than sharecroppers. The only people who had private land were the church, were the Kohanim, the crown and the priest. This is the feudal system. Everybody else was nothing more than a sharecropper on the crown's lands. This is, we, uh, this is our claim to fame that our great great grandfather or uncle, Yosef Atzadik, is the creator of the feudal system. Not that proud of it personally. But at the time, that was obviously very functional, that lasted for a long time. So let's understand that typical Egyptian was not exactly rolling in wealth. Typical Egyptian was a poor man, lived in his mud bear house, and he was a sharecropper. That's what he was. If you think, if you're an American, think of the sharecroppers going back, you know, during the, uh, in the South, etc., or in the dust bowls of Idaho and Iowa. You understand what a sharecropper is. He's not exactly a Balabatish person. This is the typical Egyptian. So what happened? The, the Israelites were menial laborers, but it's the same thing. Also, menial laborers, they worked in construction, not in agriculture. That's what it boils down to be. Let's be very honest about this. So they were totally uh, part of that nation. That's why the Chazal say that extricate the Jews from Egypt was taking out a fetus from the womb of a cow. The idea of a fetus is because the fetus is nurtured totally by the mother. Ubar Yerech Imo. The fetus is, so to speak, a limb of the mother. It's part of the mother's existence. It's, a, it, it's nurtured by the mother. Everything happens because of the mother. We were part of Egypt. Well, then, due to the fact that we had no beliefs at all, we definitely did not believe in monotheism. Okay, let's put this on the table. Now, you can, if you read this chapter in Yechezkel further, at source you would base at the end, you will see that the Jews struggled with monotheism 40 years in the desert. And the real background of why the Jews did not enter Eretz Yisrael, if you want to read the Navi here, it says because they wanted to keep Avodah Zorah, and because of that, they did not want to keep Shabbos. Because Shabbos is an idea of saying that God created the world, and therefore it's not an old world, but it's a world created, Yeshmi'ai, from God. The Jews did not, even after Matu Taira, want to accept that. These are psukim, for goodness sakes. I'll just show you a few of them, just to understand what it is. Um, go back to Sorshid Bet, the Yechesko Perik and I'll read it to you. Yud Pasik Yud Gimel. This is after Matan Taira. The Pasik was, Be Amru Be Beis Yisrael Bamidbar. And they rebelled me, the house of Israel, in the desert, who did not follow my statutes, as mishpatai ma'asu, my laws, they basically were bound by them. They couldn't care less about them. There's a word ma'od, they really were going to be mechalal, desecrate the Shabbos. This is after Matan Torah. These are parts of the Chumash, not found in the Chumash, but God tells us this through Yechezko. It's very hard to read Chumash without knowing this parent. I wanted to destroy them in the in the desert, basically to annihilate them. But Aslaman Shmi, again, I did for my name. It shouldn't be desecrated in the eyes of the nations, etc. And therefore he said, look at that Vav Nasati Bamidbar. But I did raise my hand and said, so the God's oath not to bring us in Eretz Yisrael, interesting. The focus is not the Maraglim and all the other nice speeches that we get in Shul, but rather the focus is because we simply want, did not want to keep Shabbos and we did not want to keep all this. Why not Shabbos? Because Shabbos is the Zecher Lemay Seberations. We did not want to accept the fact that the world is created by an omnipotent uh, one God. Shabbos is the, is, I see that what the, the God created the world. They didn't want to accept that. You must understand that we suffered from our Egyptian culture all through history. Now you understand really why during the first, second temple period, multitudes of Jews and the kings were pagans. It's not just that they were touched by the, so to speak, by the, by, 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 by the Canaanite nations. They carried this baggage with them from Egypt. 
This is what Yechesed, if you read the care Pasuk carefully, you will see that all through, even before Yitzhiz Mitzrayim, during Yitzhiz Mitzrayim, I can add during Kriya Shiam, Sufi Gemara says that we had the pagan of Edezora in our pockets. And you can go further all through, literally, till you come to Echisko. Look at the last Pasuk Chav Gemma. Gamanina sati yati lehem bamidbar. I swore that we uh, immersed between the nations. This is our goal. Is why? Not because of the Miraglim. Not because we didn't want to go to Edge of Throne. Yan, Mishpatai Lo Asu. We did not do the laws of God. They abhorred the statutes of God. And they desecrated my Shabbos. We're talking about Mamish right before coming into Eretz Yisrael. And the Avodah of their forefathers, they were still looking for there. There you have it. This goes across the board. So let's put this straight. We're not looking at our beautiful brown eyes. God saved us because we embrace monotheism. The embracing of monotheism by the Jews coming out of Egypt was basically like a person with a dead mortar, which was jump-started artificially by Gilu Shina, by Kofa Lem Harke Gigish. There were a lot of things which gave us artificial highs. And you know what? Short term, this... In long term, it worked. In the long term of history, those Jewish, China, etc., now because that we today are monotheistic people. But on the whole, at that period of time, it was hundreds of years until that finally settled. I want this to be understood. The fact that there were even 40, 38 years of silence in the Midbar, I find, is a mirror, a palish anchor the Masa. But how long did it last? It went to the Navi over here as soon as they came towards Yatisral, they blew it all over again. You really should read this parik. It's a very parik to understand what happened in Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Reintroduction of the Jews to monotheism, trying very care, very hard actually, to extricate them almost artificially from pagan beliefs and values. And it was not easy, it took a lot, a lot of time. In light of this, start reading the Chumash again and looking at the complaints of the Jews. Don't make them into Muhammad Bav Tzadikim, according to the Rabbi Yechestel of here, which I think is the best parshan of Chumash, because it's God himself. God is probably the commentary on Chumash, I think he is. It's his book, so these are his notes. He seems to be saying, Yingala, let go with the drushes. This is the undercurrents of history. That's what's happened. This is the tension of man and God all the way back then. In light of this, understand what those, what the, uh, what the, uh, what, the, what, what the ten plagues are. To do this, I want you to look carefully at Source Ted Zion. Look at Source Ted Zion. Source Ted Zion is Vayemra Hashem El Moshe, and God said to Moses, Bo El Paro, come with me to Pharaoh. Yanich Bati Es Libo. I made his emotions callous, heavy at his heart, means he's become callous. The esleva vadav, and also the emotions of his, I don't say heart, because your heart is nothing more than a pump. I mean, your feelings are callous. Okay, leva vadav, what for? Why did I do this? Leman shiti ototai ele bikibo, in order to implant the signs of my existence. An oat is not, oat is a proof. An oat, a mofa, also a proof, but a moped has to be something which is not normal. Os is simply, I can give you an ice, I'm giving you something to remember, Rabbi. It's a simon. Ice means a simon. Ototai ele bikirbo. I want to the simonim, the, 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 the indicators of my existence in, in, in the Egyptians. Why? The goal of this for you to tell your children and your grandchildren, what? with the Egyptians, and I did to them, it's not enough to tell the story. But you must now tell the indications of my existence. You must look at these Nesim Pella and say, how does this indicate monotheism? 
something we don't, most of us do not do, and this is wrong, because we're basically walking away from a Pusik and Chumash. The whole Nisim and the Flush were there for one reason only, Osos. They're indicators of the one God creator of all. And you're supposed to take these things and see how this indicates that. Now you understand why the Ramam between Ness and Pella, it's no big deal that God can play with science. The fact that he runs the daily mill of science. That there is no such thing as a law of science. He decides when it is or when it isn't. That's the basic idea. Not that there's some supernatural God which can play and change things. No. He runs the daily drag. And he can decide, he will decide that the frogs will not come here. He will decide that the lights will come here. The Pella is probably the most important thing if you want to believe that God runs the show and the such a thing as a natural phenomenon. But natural phenomena are also expressions of the ongoing will of God. God created a system, and that system is the will of God. So when you look in the telescope and the microscope, what you're looking at are indicators of God's Chachma and Ratzon. That is what we're supposed to be doing. It's Ototaish Santi, and what's the end of the Pasik? You tell your children for what purpose? There's three or four words here. datem, and you will know. We many times we taught Yidia means to say, not just you have a cerebral intelligence, Yidia means translating cerebral intelligence into emotional awareness. We discussed this multitudes of times. The difference between Pachma, Bina, and Das. Das means translating cerebral information into, we have a lot of cerebral information, translating into emotional intelligence, which therefore creates emotional reactions because it's vivid and it's real. That's the job of the story. Be that tem, and you will know emotion, you will have emotional intelligence. Ki ani, for I am Yud Kei Yud Kei we learned in the past, means Hovekat Ramban in Parshas Yisro. Hovekat Maun, the primary existent, Shemimenu HaKol, that from him is all, Bechepso Uviyacholto, due to his expression of his will and his omnipotence. This is what Yud Kei means. In other words, the goal of the night later is that. The goal of the Aseris HaMakos is that. It is not to tell stories of Egypt. The ultimate goal of the whole Yom Tif is actually not enough to have faith. With great respect to the language of faith, we discussed this also in the past. No, we need to say to be able, what do we deduce from the fact of these Asar Nisim, and these Niflois and Nisim? I repeat, the eight Niflois and the two Nisim. The God created the world and runs the show on a daily basis. And every, there's no such thing as a law of science. It's the ongoing will of God. He can decide there's no more gravity in a second from now. And I will not be surprised. Because I only have 5,000 years or 6,000 years of recorded human experience out of who knows how many years of existence. I don't even have a statistic to tell me that it's probably going to continue. A shvache chazaka, to say the least. Taisus writes in Chulun, Unless you know something was definite, then it continues. But I don't know. I never knew that gravity is definite. Out of X amount of years, whatever they are, ask any uh, modern day astronomer and tell me what's 6,000 years of recorded human experience. And you call that a law? You wouldn't be able to. You, are you kidding? I, 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 that's not even a statistic. It, it's, it's less than a drop in a bucket. It's less than a drop in a bucket. You know what? The answer is you're right. It isn't. It's not a law. It's nothing. It's Ratzon Hashem. Out of comfort, I want to function as a human being. I will decide. Until now, it should continue. But that's Ratzon HaKadosh Baruch Why do I know that? Because a pussy can carry well. It says, Va'aris, the oil of my medicine, means the Pasuk Bella said that the Chazaka that will continue. That's why I know the gravity is going to continue because Schleimer writes it in his page. That's how I know it. Otherwise, how do I know it? So I want you to understand where the Jews were at. They were totally pagans. And I want to read this in the Ramban in chapter in, in source Yud Zayin, that's 
last page of the sources, the second chapter, the second paragraph, and that will be enough, leaving you to read all the rest on your own. Lachen Yomar Katuv, therefore the scriptures say, Bamofim, Mofet mean. Mofet does not mean a miracle. A Mofet means a proof. Ot is an indication. Mofet ze raya. Mofet chotech means to say a cutting edge proof. When they say moifsim, it doesn't mean miracles, it means indicators and proofs of his existence. Leman teida ki ani Hashem. That's the passage. In order that you should know that I am God, where be careful of it. What's that for? Lo horot al hashgacha. The man tida kani Hashem be careful of it is to show you that I actually intervene into what's happening in the world here. What that pasuk talking about? If you go to source your Dalid, that pasuk is talking about it's in Shmois Ches pasuk Yud Ches, where the pasuk says we flatey by Yomahu et Eretz Goshen. And I will actually set aside, separate Eretz Goshen that day, Asher Ami Omed Olev, which my people are standing there, Lebilkiyah Yotshem Arov, the Orov, the, the wild animals, will not come into there. What for? In other words, I'm going to show that there's going to be a, a, an imaginary boundary which the animals won't cross. Now, that's not normal. That's really a manipulation. But why am I doing it? The point that I decide where they go and where they don't go. I will decide who they damage, who they don't damage. That's called Ashgacha Pratis. That's it. That God choose, is involved in what's happening in this world. He didn't just create a world and let it work with haphazard realities. He calls shots. So he says the first Ramban, that person is to teach me Laurotal Hajgacha. He didn't just leave us totally haphazard. There is hashgacha pratis, therefore there is going to be sachar and there's going to be einish. Granted, there will also be haphazard realities as we discussed in the past, but there's going to be sachar and there will be einish. Okay, that's what. So that is actually a three three makos are have that caption. If you look carefully, the b'tzach adash ba'achav are categorized by three separate psukim. And we're going to see them now. One group is exactly that. This is uh, th this is talking about the differentiation between Jews and others. This is Hashgacha. Then the next one, the Amar. This is a positive. You should know that the world belongs to God. To teach us Allah Chidush. That it is a God-created world, and the world wasn't always there. A typical Kfira uh, uh, found, Ramam deals with it at length, and the God reflects very Greek. But it's very, very, very ancient. People did not want to believe in a supreme creator. They wanted to believe in a world which is always there with entities which would somehow mix, get involved, whether or they would help you or whatever it only be. And so he said, the Horat al-Chidush, Kehem Shalom, Shabaram. It's his world. And he decided, he created the Mi'ayin from North. That's another thing. So Ashgacha and Bria Yesh Mi'ayin. The third thing is, V'yamar, Babur Teda Ki Ein Kamoni B'chala Aretz. That's a Pasuk, actually, if you go to Source Tesvav, that's the beginning of Borod. Borod, Borod is introduced with Ein Kamoni B'chala Aretz. Now, what do you have? To, what's that for? This that to show that he has all the capabilities. Not that there's a Neptune in the ocean and there's something in the skies, and therefore they don't get together. No, I'm going to have water and fire working together because I am the owner of them both. And that's called Asher I don't have partners. I am so the creator of it all, and I can do what I want with them. And fire and water will work together in tandem. This is the idea of the Barat. And Kamaini Bakalaritz, Ramban writes the Horotal Yecholet to show that the God is omnipotent. All is within his hands. Shu Shalit Bakol, he is dominant in everything. Ain Ma'akev Biado, there's nothing stopping him from doing what he wants. Why do we need these things? Hashgacha, Chidush, and the idea Shalit Bakol. So the Ramban writes, Ki Bechol Zeh. Hayu amitzrim makhishim o mistapkim.
These were the dominant issues in Egyptian paganism at the time. The culture of Egypt either denied Kiddush, Hashgacha, or omnipotence, Kol Yachol, or was mystopic in it. You had the different types of people. No one believed, yes, Thus, these indicators and these proofs, a deem they are testimony, they are true testimony, in the faith that there is a creator, and thus the Torah, because you're actually believing in Ashgacha, so you're believing in dialogue with God, with man, and you believe in the Bible. This is what this is. So the Ramban clearly writes, this is the idea that tells us that the night of Pesach is to be used to understand that there are otot and moftim. It is there to see how do we analyze these things to teach us en kamayni b'chol ha'aretz, l'ashem ha'aretz, and l'ashem ha'aretz, and basically k'ani b'kare v'aretz, ashgacha. How do we how do we get the Yesodos Amuna or Yesodos Ayadia? Because these are Osos and Mopsim. How do these things indicate this? Because that's what God did it for. God did it exactly for that reason. Why three makot in each bracket for Edut? Uh, I'm not going to be talking about that at the moment, but look at the Maforshim on uh, on the Rebuta Yenoisbem Simonim, the Tzach Adash Be'echab. You'll see those the three categories. You did. Why three? I can't answer at the moment. Okay, they don't have time. Good question. That was Aaron. Good question. Um, try me next time. Okay, let's first get back to this. So this is what the night is for. I say this because I want to understand something. Ram says, so that's number one that we have to talk about. The Pusik says very clearly that's what the night of Pesach is for. To have a discussion of monotheism, and basic beliefs and doctrines and show how the um, platform of our knowledge starts with the occurrence of the Exodus. The Exodus is the platform from, wh from whence we have our doctrines afterwards uh, revealed through Sinai and through Nevi'im, but basically the epic of the Exodus has to be analyzed and conceptualized into these things, as the Ramban told us very clearly. I really hope you will read the Ramban again in Source of Zion, okay? That's number one, which is a very important thing. Number two, I want to look at something else which is important, Halacha Beis. Halacha Beis, the Ramban writes, Mitzvah Lahodiyah Nim is a mitzvah to, to let the children know about this. And it's not enough for you to talk to yourself no, yes, I want you to say, every LA, you know, I think the nicest Pesach I ever had was in COVID. I was only there with my wife, no children or grandchildren. We could actually have a Seder at whatever academic level we that we share. And we were learning Murray the Vuchim. And we were talking learning the Prakim Murray the Vuchim, dealing with all these different topics. It was beautiful. It was great. It was the same of the way God meant it to be. You know what I mean? This, obviously, a small child can't do that. But this is what it's meant to be. You have to find time for yourself, too. This is a rejuvenation, a, a, a refresher course in the fundaments of faith. And they have to become yediya. You know what that means? It can't just be faith. It has to be internalized knowledge. So look at the, what we do for children, something we're missing. The Ramam says you have to tell the children, the father teacher has to teach according to the capabilities of the child's comprehension. Um, is there value in spelling the child all these uh, uh, Russian and Vertalach and this? Is there value in that? No. The value is whatever will enhance, ultimately give, give a basis to understanding why he's Jewish and why he's doing mitzvahs. You'll see in a minute. Ketza, imaya katan otipesh. He was a minor, a small child. Otipesh, a bit of a fool, not very bright. Omer lo, he says, what do you say to your child? This is a gemara and psachim. B'ni, my son. 
Kulano ayinu abadim. We were all slaves. Now, you talk to a typical child today in America, he won't know what a slave is. Unless he saw a face first Roots by Alex Haley, you know what I mean? And he remembers Kunta Kinte and uh, what's it called there? Chicken George, your face, whatever the name was. Or he saw this movie, 12 Years, or whatever it be. He saw something which depicted the situation in America pre, you know, before emancipation. We today do not want when we talk about slaves. When we talk about slave labor in, uh, in, in Nazi Germany and Poland, it's more of extermination camp than slaves. There are, there were, do the children know what slave labor is? Have they experienced, do they know what slaves are? Well, the Raman points out based on the Gemara that you can actually show him a slave. Raman says, Kimo shif chazu, o kimo zeb. We were that. So now analyze what is slavery and say, this is what we were. How many children really know what slavery is? So you're going to tell them about terrible pain and angst. Whipping, whipping is not an issue of slavery. Slavery can be even a person living in luxury, but he's a slave. It's a Gemara in Gittin. Avdan Shilkotsin, the man's living in silks, but he's still a slave. So what exactly is the idea of slavery? What is the opposite of slavery? It's not pleasure. But it's freedom. He says, and on this night, Pada God redeemed us. And he took us into freedom. A theme which we ignore mostly during the night of Pesach. Do we discuss the juxtaposition, the difference between slavery and freedom? Appreciating freedom versus slavery. It sounds like a July 4th discussion, but this is actually the night of Pesach. It is very clear that we have, why is this needed for you? Datem Kenya Hashem, I will explain. The Gemara says, why is it that the slave which chooses to stay in slavery and is bored by his ear? Because the ear that heard that I am your God, and therefore I am your king and you are my slave, chooses to take another Lord upon himself. Judaism demands actually freedom. There is no one above you except for God. You may be employed. That's not a slave. A slave is a person which has no agenda. A slave is a person which has no eye except for being an extension of the alter ego of the, uh, of the master. Read your Alex Haley and you'll understand. You don't even have your own name, brother dear. You, you are called what I fear called Toby. You know what I mean? If you don't like it, you get your foot cut off. There's no such thing. Judaism tells us that. You know, we have to remember, you say in uh, Shabbos. Remember, when it says Ana Avda, the Kutshabrichu, it doesn't mean Evid Ivri. It means an Evid Knani. Because in Evid Ivri, the Gemara says, Kol Mishikona Evid Ivri, Kona Adon Laatzmo. Many people think, yeah, I'm an Evid Ivri of God, so I can tell him what to do. And a Jewish Evid tells the master what to do. If the master has a good pillow, he has to give it to the Evid Ivri and not to his family. If he has better food, he must give it to the Evid Ivri. Not, he's just a glorified employee. He has a personality of his own. It is only the Evid Knani, which is, is nothing. He is nothing more than the extension of the alter ego of the master. To the extent that even things that shlichus doesn't work, you can't send an agent, but your evid is an extension of yourself. Halacha. I'm not going into the nafkemiz. Major nafkemiz, sigmarim bab metziah. Evid shaloi is stronger, more an expression of your master than a shaliach to a shaliach. So we say, ana abdi the kutshabrich, we're saying we have no identity at all. We're nothing more than slaves. I hate using the word as uh, Avodas Hashem. I think we should call it Avdus Hashem. Okay? Get out. You're not, it's not the service of God. You're a slave. Can you get that into your mind? Well, the only way you can be a slave, God does not want to make us slaves. Only first we have to accept upon ourselves the yoke of his dominance. It's called Kabbalah's Ol. Malchus Shemayim. That cannot be done until you're a free person.
Because if you're someone else's slave, you are not a gaver. You're not a person which can make your own decisions. Don't have your own mind. You don't. You're no. You're you're a thing. You first have to be your own person. Decide I'm going to enslave myself to the to the monarchy of God, to His values, and to His being. That's called the world of free will. We want you to have the free will, make the decision, and make the right decision. You cannot be an Eved Hashem unless you're a Ben Chayrin. That's what the Gemara says, even being an Eved Ivri, but by tying yourself down until the Yoivel, not immediately embracing your freedom, but having something above you, which is not necessary, is somehow saying you're not that interested in being an Eved of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Want us to understand that. We discussed this multiple times. The Kabbalah's O Malchus Shemayim demands awareness, consciousness, and the capability of choice. All things are lack. The Ebed thinks master, breathes master, talks master, 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 or rather, when the old South, Massa, M A S S A. That would be the word. Okay, Massa. So this is what we're talking about. So this is when we say we have to celebrate freedom. When the last time we did that on the night of Pesach? Freedom in context of Malchus Shemayim. It all goes back, we're talking about the platform on which our religious life exists. It starts with being free. Free from anybody else and making the conscious decision of moving into monotheism through the Osos and the Mopsim. So we had to be physically freed of Egypt in order to ultimately be culturally freed of Egypt. It was quite easy to extract the Jews from Egypt. It took a long time to extract Egypt from the Jews. That was the hardcore reality. So this is what the Rabbim says. Another very important idea. We have to celebrate freedom. And then there's something else. I want to go to Allah Dalit, and this is where it's very important. Allah Dalit, the Rambam writes, "V'tzarich latchil b'gnut l'sayem b'shvach." This is a two days in the Gemara, Rab and Shmuel. You must start by saying the downside of things, and ending by praising God for the good things. You basically, we have to just, we have to uh, juxtapose darkness to lightness, which is the constant theme of the evening. Question to answer, ignorance to enlightenment, gnut to shvach, downside to upside. And then looking at all, look, this is a transition created by God. Ketzad, what do we do? So he points out something that uh, I don't want to go into what I'm arguing with. I'm going to read the Ramah the way it's written. The Ramah points out there are two major themes of the evening. And the Ramah points out in his order of things, that yes, there's a major number one and there's a secondary number two. And this is what he says. Ketzat, matchil umesaper, you start. And this is actually how we really start the Agada. And we say, shebetchila in the very beginning of time equals when? Going back to Enosh through Terach until Avraham. Mitchila hayu avutenu bimei Terach umelfanav. Again. Does the child know the history of paganism? They read this and they don't know. Do they know what they're saying? To do this, you actually have to learn the first chapter of Rambam in Yuchat Zorah. And if you don't, you're not doing what has to be done. Mitchila, we may tear umul fanav. The Rambam is pointing out we must tell the whole chain of history from Enish, Dora Babel, Dora Palaga. All the way until Avraham Avinu, which is Dora Palaga. Kofrim, the Gutayin Achra Hevel, they were heretics and they were misled following that which it has no consistency. That's what Hevel means. Ramban, the beginning of Hevel, Hevel means things that have no consistency, like a fog. We wrote Fim and they were pursuing Achra Avedizor. Why were they pursuing? I think I once taught this actually in Los Angeles 15 years ago. Remind me to teach this some other time. This is a, that's a story. That's what we say. And what's the end of that story? The next line. That's what the Rama writes. How do you end the story? 
in the true religion, that God brought us close to him. He separated us from those who live in mistake. He brought us close to what? To his monotheism. That's the story. And Rabbi sees this as the first part of the story. And it's actually what happens. It's the beginning of the Agada. And that is a separate unit. Before we go further talking about Egypt, we must see Egypt as nothing more than the platform of being reintroduced to monotheism. We discuss the history of paganism and how we are basically developed into monotheism. And that's stage number one. And this is the fulfillment of the passage that we just read before, Vyedatem Kiani Hashem. That's a Masch Bignus Umesayim Bishvach. That's number one that we're supposed to be doing Seder night. Then Ramdivchain and also anybody sensitive to language of Rambam, when he brings things in that order, he's saying this is the Aleph, this is the base. Vikhain and also. Matchil, he starts another narrative. It's not a same, same story with two endings. Matchil, he starts a new story. Umardia, and he lets know to the children, Shavadim Ainu Lafarov Bitsraim. A, we were slaves, as the aforementioned, as opposed to free men. B, Vachala Ra'ashik Malanu, also the terrible things he did to us. A, slavery. B, it was a bitter slavery. Again, focus on the slavery. Also, it was a bitter slavery. Two things. We will say, yeah, and how do you end that? Banisim vaniflaot. Again, with the miracles and the wonders, the Ramam creator is the same idea he started with. Shenasu lanu, that happened to us. Ubecherutenu and our freedom. So there are two themes of the evening. Primary theme of the evening is the movement from paganism to monotheism. Taking into account the Osos and the Mopsim, etc., how those happen. Number two, tell the story of Egypt in order to basically talk about the, the movement from freedom, from slavery to freedom, actually a terrible slavery into freedom. But first of all, in our freedom. And where does this happen? So he says, but who, where do we do this? She Yidrosh. We say the drushes, so they said we take the four psukim found in Tvarim, in Bidre Maestris. And what did we do? And we say the drushes chazal on that. The drush, me arami oved avi, achi gmor kol parsha, which is all the four psukim. That is the second thing. V'chala mosif umarich bedrush parsha. So if you want to elaborate, elaborate on that parsha. Not say Vertolach of Avada, why the Chacham is near the Russia and the Russia is near this. That's not part of the deal. It's totally wasting an evening. Every minute is precious. The theme of the evening is monotheism and freedom. That's the theme of the evening. What do we, with Marich, uh, mean to say, according to Ramam, is to discuss the, the idea of freedom. How do we discuss it? We discuss all the parshas of Arami Ovid Ovi describing the slavery, the raw in the slavery, and ultimately Bechevrusenu, Asher Galanu Vagal Zavisenu. That's what you say. Okay? Bechala Mosipu Maria Vidrash Parsha Zu, what that should be underlined, the word Zu, as opposed to uh, all these different uh, goddesses you have. Babachab, Baltashkis and Jewish time. Hareza Mishubach. This is what Chazal say is Mishubach. So I'm trying to say this because it's really very important. I'm going to finish this now and we'll continue this obviously next time around if there will be a request for it. Uh, I do want to continue. That is, we've learned two, three major, three major things. First of all, actually two. The major, major theme of the evening is to understand how we move from paganism painfully back to monotheism based on the nisim and the flows. That peric in Yechezkel has to be read the Iyun Rav to see how painful it was. In light of that peric in Yechezkel, we should review all the parshas from the Torah dealing with the Midbar. Woo! 
they will begin to make sense. They will begin to make sense. And there's a lot of pieces there which the Chumash doesn't tell us. Okay? We went into Gullus and we didn't come to Echisor because we did not want to keep Shabbos. We did not totally want to embrace monotheism. And even when we came in, we didn't. <laughs> we were never deserved, for goodness sakes. Look at your Tanakh and read. Right minions, your minions of, 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 of Malchai Shemrai were all Ivdavid Zora. Omri was not exactly wearing Tchelis, neither was Acho. And should I go on and on? I mean, it's endless. One Esther, I always say that people ask me, but how can this be a Malchus if they're a bunch of Kaifrim? I said, you think Achav was wearing Tzitzis? You think Omri was a Tzadik Yisrael Oilam? And Yane was a Melech, goodness sakes. And he had to be Mechav a Melech. He kills the rabbis. So far, Baruch Hashem, no one's killing the rabbis here in my country. Now, this is a Malchus. We have to be Mechav a Malchus of Yidin. It's a double push to me. I mean, and we did learn Tanakh would understand some of these things are atrocious with being said. So that, without going into rabbinic figures there, what people have to say, I'm an old-fashioned Jew, Gemara, Rambam, Mechulu. Ufchein. So get this straight. What have we learned? The themes of the evening. Transition from mon paganism to monotheism, starting from Enosh, through Terah, until what finally happened in Egypt through the Isis and the Mifsin. Homework, Ram of Hilchas have I deserved, Perik Aleph, all of it. Yechestel Perik Chah, all of it. And good old, so to speak, Ramban, all this is found here in Shmais, Perik Yud Gimel Pasik Tezai. That's number one. Second of all, freedom. You know, in Woodstock, Witchy Havens of Blessed Memory had this song called Freedom. Listen to it. I'm saying freedom. Appreciating freedom. Something which I hate to say it. We don't talk about that. I, I've been, I was a kid. I grew up. I saw what it was like. I've changed the face of things, thank God, to my family. But yeah, we talk about freedom. About just being free. You know, talk about the French Revolution and the American Revolution. Talk about everything. Talk about freedom. Talk about what you're supposed to do with freedom. Why does, is freedom inherently part of our religion? We have to be free in order to make decisions. What does slavery mean? Yes. The Ramam says you have to show him a slave. They should understand what a slave is. Show him a shifcha. I don't know. You should show them films or read a book. I told my students you should read Alex Haley's Roots or see it on television. I don't know, whatever you have over there. You know, I understand what a slave is. Appreciate freedom. And then take that freedom to become subjugated to God. Those are the major themes. And these are Psukim and Chumash, Psukim and Navi, and Open Rambam. That should be enough for the evening. We'll, con we'll convene in two weeks. Bye, my friends. Love you all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Bow to Bracha Vatzlacha. Oh, how are you doing, Jay? Oh, you're, you're at work. I love that beard, man. <laughs> Hi, Ben. Hey. Bye. Bracha Vatzlacha. Amen. Take